Welcome everyone to this morning's live question and answer session with Jake Price. Uh, good to have you here. My name is Aaron. I'm a helper of the Compassion Film Festival and so delighted to introduce to you our two special guests today. Uh, in front of us, we have Jake Price here. He is the filmmaker of one of our short films, uh, the labeled uh, The Seeds of an Uncertain Land. We're so delighted to have Jake here to discuss further answer questions about his film and some other, other work that he's doing. Uh, interviewing today is a good friend, a mentor, and a very special guest, Laura Bartelt. She is the executive director of the Mindful Life program and also has deep roots a couple decades, in fact, of roots in sustainable building. And we'll be offering the questions, the start. Um, for all of you attending online, you are able to chat into the chat feature, and I will be monitoring that, bringing any questions and comments you might have for Jake. Uh, into this meeting to be broadcast out to you all. So we're delighted that you're here to join us. And those of you who are joining in the future, this recording will be available until August 22nd on Sunday. So without further introduction, I welcome Laura and Jake. Thank you both so much for being here and for adding to the seeds of compassion here at our Compassion Film Festival. Thank you, Aaron. And yeah, I wanna extend also a big welcome to Jake. It's um, something I've been looking forward to in terms of just this opportunity to have this conversation and to learn more about your work and, um, and your motivations. I notice on your website that um, it says stories that explore the connections between land and culture, science and community, and all that's worth holding on to. So, and what a wonderful um, encapsulation of uh, what you find meaningful, apparently. And Thanks. so we're lucky to have you. Um, Very glad to be here. So it was wonderful to watch this movie. It has so many, uh, taps into so many things for me personally. Um, but I wanted to start by just saying that it's so clear from reading about your work and your range of experiences internationally that you get exposed to a lot of stories that you could tell. And I know that you know, choosing to make one particular film is, is sort of filtering out some other things and saying, this is the one, this is the mm -hmm. one I wanna tell right now. So, can you start by just telling us how did you come to make this particular film, The Seeds of an Uncertain Land? Right, so um, I guess there's two major events that preceded that. Uh, we're actually sadly seeing a kind of recursive thing that's happening in Haiti today. Yes. Um, so before, before I went to Puerto Rico, I, um, I worked extensively in Haiti in, uh, following the earthquake. Um, and then uh, I wasn't intending to go to Japan after the tsunami, but um, especially after Haiti, uh, but, but I decided to go because I, I felt that I could tell the story a little bit better. And I thought I was just going there very briefly. Um, and I ended up staying basically for 10 years, uh, working mostly in Fukushima. And Fukushima and, and Haiti were similar in ways in that there was uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of lack of hope um, and, and, and so I, I wanted to tell a regenerative story. And I, th I, I think looking at the stories that we see coming out, we only see the direct impact and then the attention moves elsewhere. And that happened in Hurricane Maria as well in Puerto Rico. Um, I have many Puerto Rican films and, and both the producers are, are, are from Puerto Rico. So we said, no, we want to we don't want to just run into the disaster. We want to show the capacity and the intelligence of the people. And let's not look away from the hardship, but let's look at how we address it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, this film highlights, as you say, sort of this regenerative movement. Um, in the film, one of the women, I believe, say this is a resistance movement. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that um, in spending time with these people who are involved in this, um, that, um, that their hope carries them? I, one thing I noticed was 
such of a sense of community and camaraderie and, and joyfulness. Um, but there's also such difficulty and, and, uh, and uh, potential for, as they say, you know, future hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So can you sort of just describe what this resistance movement or regenerative movement is in this particular instance feels like? Yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of the resistance movement, it's, it's strange that it should even be called a resistance movement because all, all, all they're resisting or, or all that they're doing is, is actually really positive, um, positive farming. Um, but I think because we have big AG, because we have all the colonial practices put on Puerto Rico, just the simple act of farming and having um, and, and inviting people in whoever they are kind of does become a resistance movement, right? It's taking off the tie and putting on the trousers and people are told to these days put on the tie and forget the trousers. Mm -hmm. um, so these small acts are actually subversive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would say um, we see this kind of um, localization of farming happening. You know, I, we have it here in Carbondale, Colorado, in wonderful ways, and right. through this va valley and, and nearby valleys. Um, can you talk about what you saw as uh, um, sort of al already as implications of that being started? How is that filtering out uh, mm. and having some influence? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I, you know, I've it's it's filtering out because you see it in Carbondale, and um, my hope of making this film was was that we can continue to filter this out, and and I think that one of the ways that I did this is I I really did cast the film. I got very lucky in that I was able to go to the first um, uh, Agri Ecology Festival. Um, presentation in Puerto Rico with all of these young farmers. And I just wanted to kind of change the notion of what farming is because everybody is, is you know, extremely attractive, extremely bright, extremely sharp and passionate. And so it's not your old farmer with a broken back anymore. It's, it's, it's people with body art and piercings. Um, and so I kind of wanted to say, this is the kind of the coolest thing you can do. And by the way, there's some very cool people doing it. Um, so I hope that it does, you know, resonate in, in, in New York, uh, our cool neighborhood, Williamsburg, things like that. Um, you have them, you know, in, in, in Boulder and Colorado and all of that. And so I'm just saying, like, I hope that we can all start to see the, the worth and the, the wonder of, of being attached to the natural world because we, we all need that. But at the same time, it's hard work, but it's also work that does regenerate the spirit. Um, and, and so I think through that hard work, there's a real great connection and, and joy. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think a plus of our lives, right? So when we're talking about changing our values or changing the way that we live, I think there's a connotation here that something is being taken away. And I wanna actually say that this way of life is an additive. It's not that you're not gonna be able to do the things you were doing before, but you kind of have to change the way that you're doing them. Um, and, and I think that that's the change that we is, is required to also address this climate crisis. Yeah, and what a wonderful example of um, change uh, that, that brings sort of that positive, joyful connection, uh, rather than, you know, often a resistance movement has an edge to it and, 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 and has the focus perhaps on the, what makes us have the experience of anger or right. um, so, so this, what this is about is bringing people together uh, and, and bringing some joy and uh, as you say, connection to the land, that regenerative part of, uh, of that it, itself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that we can almost call it an acceptance movement, not, not <laughs> because they're, they're actually not resisting people coming in. They're just being resisted, being told what to do in a patriarchal or, or corporate or, or, um, or, or, or colonialist society. But in a way, it's an acceptance movement, really. That's truly what it is. Can you talk for a moment, too, about there's a comment in um, the film about, you know, that we learned this from the peasants. 
and we're combining it with scientific knowledge. So there's this, this marriage, um, and, and I would say mutual respect then of indigenous knowledge uh, right. and science knowledge. And, um, you know, I find that incredibly fascinating. I was um, lucky enough to be at a climate change uh, conference years ago where NASA scientists and uh, elders and, and indigenous people from uh, North America came together to share what knowledge uh, you know, they could so that it could build on each other. Can exactly. you speak to what you saw about that or how that is being held? Right. So, I, you know, I, I think that ancient knowledge is, is not necessarily time-based in a way. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it makes perfect sense that it fits in with science, right? So, really what, what, what ancient knowledge is, is it's, it's just centuries of looking at what works. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the difference now is that with science, we just have the tools to quantify that. And I think the, the discipline to say, this is how we quantify the empirical evidence. But I, I think that when we think about uh, um, native societies, they've been practicing science. I think the same way that Buddhism will practice science. Uh, there was a beautiful thing that Dalai Lama um, said this weekend, I was just researching another thing. And so much, he's saying, you know, it's not about convincing me to believe in the Buddha, right? So it's about questioning why I believe it. And if you don't believe in him, then you walk away and you say, okay, I can find something else. So I, I think that kind of ancient wisdom is saying, yes, look at it. If it fits in re with reality, then you can accept it and then you can evolve on it. And, and so that's the same way that, that the Taino culture, uh, which is the native culture of Puerto Rico, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're, they're looking at how does the sun rise? Where does the wind blow? How does it disseminate the seeds? What does the rain do? How is it functioning within the seasons? That to me is science. We're just not calling it that. We're calling it wisdom. But I think the beauty of it is, and, and I think the transcendence of wisdom is that there is that beautiful emotional connection to it, which I, I, I do find science also emotional, but for all intents and purposes, it's not supposed to be that. So here's the beauty. Here's the marriage of that ancient knowledge and the fact that they do love their land and they are attached to it. Now we can just bring in the science and rather than bring in big AG, and I think here we can go back to the resistance, these farmers are saying, yes, but we can plant this particular kind of plant and it will keep away this kind of bug. Okay, we, we know that by empirical evidence, we know that by practicing it. And now science can say why, they can go into the plant and they can say, yes, this plant has this kind of chemical and this bug doesn't like it, voila, the two have come together. What a beautiful thing and and um, really speaks to the value of um, local knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 as uh, this demonstrates uh, that when that is gathered and also experienced, it uh, it, it brings something that ha has such a um, preciousness to it, really. Yeah. What else for you uh, about this film is so important? Um, what, why is this film, why did you submit this film to the Compassion Fest? Like, what's the, what's the key there? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the basis of what they do is actually compassion. You know, it, it is that they, they're not, I don't think that compassion is used once in this film, I'll have to go back and look, but, um, but it is the action of compassion, right? And so compassion is an action. Um, so that's why I submitted it. I, I, I thought these were, that, 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 that this actually was a document of compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would like to go back to Japan here. It's not that I didn't see hope. Um, so one of the things that, that, we all know Fukushima only as the disaster, only in terms of that. I, I met a wonderful woman, her name is Tomoko Kobayashi, and she was um, 
I, I was in the middle of, of, of the exclusion zone. Um, and I, I saw this woman who was allowed to visit her home very briefly on, on, on a daily basis in the afternoons. And <laughs> in the middle of this place, and I've never seen any human being there except, I just haven't seen any human beings there. Um, in, in the midst of the weeds and, and, and all of these left bicycles and just humanity, the, 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 the Doritas of humanity gone from a nuclear disaster, there was this one woman just walking around with a watering can. And I, <laughs> I thought I was seeing a ghost. And I said, who is this person? Let's go talk to her. And so she told me the story I told you she was returning. But then she said, you know, this is my home and I hate to see it overtaken by weeds and I'm the only one here. So if there, I don't know if there's gonna be a future, but if there is, then I, I wanna start planting uh, flowers that we used to have on our street to make it pretty, to, to keep my memory of this place alive. And so in the aftermath of Maria, I, I, I was thinking, yeah, I, I thought back to Tomoko and I said, no, I want to tell a positive story because all we see are stories of despair and need, uh, corruption, uh, you name it, of, of Puerto Rico. And, and it really kind of upset me that this is the way that the media always does it, right? We go in, we see the need, we see the hunger. Um, Puerto Ricans in New York, if, if there's a stabbing at the festival on Fifth Avenue for their parade, that's what gets the news but we don't see the intelligence or the capacity or the poetry. And so that's what I wanted to tell. Um, and, and, and so my time in Japan, let me rebrand Fukushima, if you wanna use that word as, as a place also that people care about and it's beautiful. And, and then the climate crisis over the past 10 years was really picking up. And I, I said, you know, these young Puerto Ricans, they're addressing it better than anybody else. And the reason why they're addressing it is because they know what it's like firsthand to go through this, to be left for dead. And going back into the compassion part, they're, they're addressing this through compassion and kindness. It's not harsh. It's not, it's not through um, any means necessary, but really kindness. Kind means. Yeah. And there we see the profound effect that compassion can have. It can rescue communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I do see now we do have some questions that I, I'm going to uh, share that uh, folks have written in. And the first right. of which is, did most of the people in the documentary have a college education? I got the feeling that they did. Correct. So the interesting thing about this movement is that um, many of these, they're kind of called the gap generation. I'm not sure if that's the exact term, but um, their families moved from the countryside to the city and their parents wanted a better life for their kids. Um, and so they pushed them into college and things like that, but at the same time they pushed them away from the land and they thought they were safe and secure with their college educations. But then they saw American colonial policy literally left them for dead and, and left elders and, and young people starving. So they said, we're on our own. We're gonna take our college degrees and education and, and ways of marketing and reaching out we're going to take that to the countryside. We're going to bring it back. We're going to go to our ancestral lands and merge the two. So um, they, they, they are mainly college educated, yes. But I think that like all of us, uh, they were yearning for a connection that they were taken away from. Well, this next question connects a little bit more to what you were just sharing. It's with these young people reconnecting with the indigenous knowledge, did you see them also connecting with ancestral roots of spirituality and faith as well? Absolutely. Um, there was a film that, you know, there, there's a saying in, in filmmaking, kill your darlings, and I unfortunately had to kill many of them. Um, there is kind of a follow-up film that I want to do with, with the young man that's featured in the beginning where he talks about his life within nature and uh, merging with it, uh, that interview that the audio of that was taken in a Taino cave. And um, he was, there's actually a lengthy segment where he talks about connecting to his heritage. He looks through the cave and he can under, he, he can imagine um, children running through it and then, and, and then helping the community and listening to their parents, listening to their grandparents. Um, and so, yes, when, when he went back to that cave, there was a big reconnection with, with, with that ancient knowledge. Mm. Thank you. Another question is, um, 
Jake, with the state of the world and your skills as a filmmaker, what is your next project that you're applying your energy to? Yeah, so I've been working with a community in Hawaii um, and they lack, um, so, so they, again, it, it's going on the theme of ancient knowledge. And, and, I, and I think that there's an exploratory process as a filmmaker that we kind of all go through, right? So I was thinking of Martin Scorsese, right? If you look at all of his films, they can be very different, but you have similar themes. And I think at the age that I'm at, I'm, I'm now able to look at the themes that I wasn't necessarily conscious of, but now I am more aware of it. So um, I, I'm, I'm working in, in Hawaii and I, I'm working with an elder Samoan there um, that is talking about ancient wisdom and again, how to bring that knowledge into modern science again, but really kind of drill in on that. And uh, you were saying that you're, you, you, you are doing regenerative um, design. I'm working with one of the foremost uh, resiliency architects here in New York that again is bringing his, his, his knowledge. But for the past three years, all he's been doing is listening to the community. He then understands how to build a, a traditional structure because those know how to withstand storms. Those know how to bring in their culture, how to place that culture. Um, it's very interesting. There's no black mold in Hawaii. Why is that? Because they know the airflow. It's a very humid place, but they use that. So he's using that airflow design into his resiliency. And with the modern science, he'll know how to build for a category five that the ancient wisdom doesn't know. Maybe they can build for a category one, but the storms are just becoming things that we've never seen in humanity before. So, you know, how do you do that? But again, the ancient knowledge and, and the science are coming together. So I really, now that I'm conscious and aware of it, I really wanna, really wanna focus on that. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask too, you know, this film begins with this solo cello, mm. which really has those, that hint of devastation in the early part. But I was so surprised to find the link to hope um, yeah. at the end of the film with the cello and, uh, and this woman's vision. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Because it was a wonderful surprise. Right, so I think from the artistic point of view, you know. I, when the producer is, is a percussionist and we were going to have percussion and then at this Congress, at this agricultural, uh, at this uh, agroecology Congress, I, I met this woman, Yatitsa, and she told me that she plays the cello and that she is a part of the Puerto Rican, um, Puerto Rican orchestra. I, I, I didn't know that Puerto Rico had an orchestra. And it really kind of challenged my notions of what Puerto Rico is. And she's Puerto Rican through and through. Um, I said, oh, you know what, let's change it. I, I really want you, Yatitsa, will you take me to your, she told me about her, her grandfather's land, et cetera, et cetera. I said, can you take me there and can you play there? Um, and so that became the vernacular of the film. They're all improvised. So we wouldn't think that cello fits in with Puerto Rico, it does. <laughs> and we didn't also think that it's, you know, we only have one composition that's European, it's Bach and the rest are, are her own. But I wanted to make the point as a director that you know, Puerto Rico is more than just one thing. Again, going back to the newspaper or going back to the popular music, it encompasses so many things. So I wanted to bring that into it. Um, and then as it relates to hope, um, yes, you know, she is again, college educated. She's played everywhere. She's played for the Pope in Rome. She's played, in all of the wonderful concert halls in South and, uh, South and Central America. Mm -hmm. um, but here she is now returning to the land and literally getting her hands dirty. We don't think of that as a cellist doing that, but that's what she's doing. And so I thought, oh, that's a wonderful note of hope and regeneration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lovely surprise as it sort of just ties in um, that theme throughout. Yeah. Uh, I know we just have uh, a few minutes left and, you know, something you said yesterday uh, when we were just doing a, a little prep for this, um, it just really strikes me and, I, and, and it's the words of that Samoan elder that you were working with. I wondered if you might speak to that um, just a moment. 
Sure. So uh, the elder that I'm working with uh, said that in his culture, Samoan, uh, Pacific Islander, they don't consider fixing things. They consider healing things. And as I look at all of the disaster that we see in our screens, especially in the last month, um, very rarely are solutions mentioned. And I, I'm, I'm really worried that if all we see is destruction, we forget about the fact that actually, no, we can regenerate, we can bring back. And so his notion of how do we heal things, I think is the first step to turning this world around because we're gonna have to. And you know that struck me because this heal versus fixing um, is is a very integrative perspective. Um, you you don't heal something by one medicine. Um, right. you, you fix something limited, but you don't heal without taking in um, a much larger perspective and picture and and uh, and the complexity. Of systems. Right. Uh, well, so it's that really very interesting. Yeah. You're making me think of acupuncture, right? Created, I, I think, by the Chinese. But there you go. It's, it's, you know, they understand that this finger here is connected to this point here. Um, and so that's science and that's ancient. And, and so now I think in Western medicine, we just think of cutting the finger off or, or we, we think of going directly to the source here. And I, I think that that's that holistic way of looking at things is the way that we also have to approach the environment, all the traumas that we're going through, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And as you said, your friend who's doing regenerative design, uh, you know, that that begins to take in a much bigger picture, not just uh, of the environment and materials, uh, but also uh, a larger time frame, as you say, as hurricanes change in strength, as indigenous knowledge is brought forward. Um, so the the what is being integrated can actually get expanded to uh, to an incredible degree. Um, exactly. To heal, to heal, yeah. Yeah, and I think healing is the mindset, compassion is a mindset, right? So I, I think, I don't know, if, I don't think we have time for the video, but I think it's more important to say that, you know, I, I think of resilience. Well, what is resilience? Resilience is built over time. Well, so is compassion. And so, you know, sometimes if, if, if we're in a bad mood or something and we just screw that person and screw them, you know, da, 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 so no, you know, let's, let's not think in those terms, but it does take a change in the mindset. So, you know, rather than saying, screw that person, we say, oh, no, no, what is that person going through? Maybe she's, maybe she's just having a bad day or maybe he's just having a bad day. Let's question that. And I think that if, if we integrate these kinds of thought processes into our daily thought processes, then when disaster strikes, mm -hmm. we're so much stronger for the community. We're, we're, we've already transitioned away from that mindset of negativity and into one of, oh, what are you going through? How can I understand you? How can I help you? How can I hate you? Yeah, building that connection and that uh, ability, that foundation for resilience. Yeah. On a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, what an important aspect, as you pointed out, just the practicality uh, of this film, yeah. but also of that message. Um, yeah. um, how compassion can be put into our lives every day, um, little by little, as we build sort of that muscle of compassion. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there it is, muscles are strength, right? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of where we were a year ago with that administration and you know, I, I think, okay, what is might? Well, <laughs> might is, if, if you're really strong, if you're truly strong, you can hold the people that, that, are, that need some help. That to me is strength. It's not, it's not building a wall or, or you know, that, that, that's weak-minded thinking. It, it's it's how, can we, how can we use the strengths that we have for others? And I guarantee you in, in, in the circle of that compassion, it comes back and it, it, it just evolves up. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful note to, um, to wrap up on. And I, I do think we'll have uh, Aaron come back and join us. There he is. Uh, just as I say that, he pops right back. <laughs> Almost like it was planned. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you both so much. Um, 
Jake, thanks for this lovely uh, discussion. Laura, incredible interviewing skills. We're, we're blown away by the interaction and for your efforts. I think from my side, thinking about Jake, how you're talking about this mindset of compassion and how through that mindset changing and instead of you know pointing the finger and blaming and getting uh, personally offended or community offended, is how do we find the might and the strength and to discover what's going on in the background and how to heal things. And so from us at the Compassion Film Festival, we wanna thank you very much for doing that exact thing. And that's part of our aspiration as a festival is to um, have filmmakers um, use their talents, their skills, the communities that they're within, their interests, and then how this compassionate mindset arises through displaying these, these beautiful stories. So. Thank you for your compassion, Laura. Thank you for yours in all of your works with the uh, sustainable building and now the inner sustainability of the Mindful Life program. Jake, best of luck with all of your future endeavors and do stay in touch with us. For those of you online, we thank you for joining us for this live broadcast. And remember, um, if you're watching this as a recording, it's available until Sunday, August 22nd in kind of in the evening, nighttime. Um, and you can connect with Jake through our film festival website. Uh, we have a bio of his there as well as linking to his websites as well, if you're interested in his work. So thank you both so much for all of your kindness, compassion, and love. Thank you, Jake. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful questions. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Aaron, for organizing this on such short notice. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it very much. And we'll, uh, we'll see you later and stay connected. Fantastic. Hopefully in person. <laughs>